Good afternoon and welcome to JCT's Fascinating Hobbies. Today's hobby, we are going to be taking a look at one of my favourite uh, pieces of retro computing equipment within my collection, that being the Amstrad ALT386. I acquired this unit at about 1996, uh, I was literally given it. Um, it was being thrown out from the person that owned it, so I managed to get it. Um, the unit itself, uh, all of the specifications were on screen just then, but uh, my particular unit is running MS-DOS version 5 and a copy of Windows 3.1. Now, you'll see on the screen now that uh, we have the actual unit on display and to the uh, left of it, no, the right of it, we have the Packard Bell 486. Now, originally, my reason for stripping this down was literally just to get the hard drive out of it. But I thought, hey, you know what? This actually would make um, a, quite a good video. Because it's quite an interesting unit to strip down. And what is really nice about these older laptops is they're like mini desktops. So nothing is crammed in. Everything is easy to take apart. And it's just generally a joy to work on. So the unit itself was released on the 1st of January 1988 and uh, at the time the 386 processor was the then uh, sort of current processor but it was still, to be honest with you, certainly for a laptop, bloody high-end processor. There was a lesser version of the ART uh, called the ART286 which obviously by the, as the name implies was running a 286 processor clocked at 12 MHz. The 386 processor in this particular unit was clocked at 16 MHz. Now at the moment you can see I'm zooming in on my RAM and coprocessor board because I have the, uh, the rather rare and optional 387 MAFS coprocessor. The actual CPU itself is on the main motherboard inside the machine, uh, which lives underneath the power supply, which is at the rear of the machine. Currently focusing on the dedicated graphics card. And what's actually quite nice about this is it is actually a dedicated graphics card. It's uh, the size of sort of like a modern um, small form factor card, uh, which in a machine of this sort of era, you know, it was pretty good. It was packing quite a good punch graphics-wise. I'm not sure of the exact RAM that the graphics card had, but it was comparable to the desktops of the time. Um, it's actually capable of VGA resolutions, so it's actually a, you know, certainly a pretty good card even for the day. So at the moment, I'm just removing the uh, the RAM expansion board uh, with that 387 processor. The machines came with either one, two, or four megabytes of RAM. What's quite nice about this one is it is fully spec'd with uh, a full 4 megabytes of RAM. Now the IDE drives, just remove that one there, the IDE drives at the time had a, um, they had a standard Molex connector but they also had a smaller connector, sort of typically the type of connector you would find on a floppy drive. And the reason why it had these two connectors is you would have the large Molex connector for your desktop application of the drive but also a smaller floppy connector for a portable application of the drive. Now what I'm actually doing now is uh, putting the hard drive back in. So I've actually served its purpose and it's proven that there is life in my uh, Packard Bell 486. And it's slotting back in. So the pain is if you wanted to actually upgrade this um, particular drive you would have to do a sort of a full strip down of the machine there's no sort of easy access port but to be honest with you it doesn't take that long to get to this level of strip down and um, as long as you're careful with the uh, the screws that you take out and you know where they're going to go back which um, I mostly did but you know there were <laughs> there were the odd one or two which I had to take out and put back into their correct place um, you can get the jobs done fairly quickly I would say that you would probably be able to take out the hard drive and upgrade in approximately uh, 15 to 20 minutes. Now, it's sort of an interesting machine from a marketing perspective because Amstrad, if I remember rightly, entered the um, personal computer market in about 1986 with uh, the, uh, the PC 1512 and 1640 series of machines. The precursor to this machine, the machine's predecessor, was uh, I believe the Amstrad PPC 640 uh, which was effectively it was the sort of size of an AT 
keyboard uh, in width. A little bit deeper, but with a sort of a flip out monitor to the right of the machine. And um, it was okay, it was sort of fairly good for what it was, but this was really the next step up. And what is interesting about this machine was it was actually built in Japan um, for the um, for Amstrad. So I'm not sure if uh, Lord Sugar made his own decisions about what products he wanted to bring to market, but you know, to bring to market a fully fledged, fully capable, pretty expandable laptop device certainly around sort of 1988 or so, was pretty impressive. I actually remember when I bought uh, this particular unit, well, sorry, when I was given this particular unit, that the battery actually still had some life in it and would still hold a charge for around about sort of 20 to 30 minutes. So I could actually get use of this particular laptop for 20 to 30 minutes before the power actually expired. And... Uh, you know, I do remember at the time actually using it for when I was at school. Would have been using it for schoolwork. So, blimey, out of doing ninety six, I would have been back in uh, back in the sixth form if I remember rightly. So yeah, I would have been seventeen. Uh, takes me back. So at the moment, what I'm doing is I'm just uh, reassembling the machine, putting the uh, the screws back into the unit itself. Something that takes um, eh, not too long, but as I said before, I was missing a couple of screws. Um, the machine itself actually has um, a 16-bit ISA slot. It's only got a 16-bit, single 16-bit slot, but to be honest with you, for a portable device, it's more than enough. At the moment, I have a 16-bit um, network card in there, but if I so desired, I could put in a 16-bit um, a, uh, sound card or some other device uh, either on an 8-bit ISA card or a 16-bit card. So the machine really is a, quite a versatile machine. As you can see at the bottom of the picture you've got a um, a port on the side of it which is for an external floppy drive but you also have an inbuilt high-density 1.44 megabyte drive 3.5 inch which um, you know is another bonus of uh, this particular machine. You also have ports on the back, you've got a parallel port, you've also got a serial port and you have an old-fashioned AT keyboard port on it as well. So there is absolutely no reason, along with the additional VGA port, why you could not use this machine as a portable desktop. You know, sort of a nice bit of um, product placement there that uh, I think uh, Amstrad was sort of a bit, a bit ahead of the game with. Uh, it was, you know, it was portable, more portable certainly than the luggable machines of the day, but also really nice keyboard as well. Certainly it's a pleasure to type on this particular keyboard and it's, even though it's uh, not a full size AT keyboard, um, obviously sort of obviously missing the full numeric keypad, it is actually a really nice keyboard to use. The screen itself is a monochrome LCD unit and as you can see, it's dis it displays a picture, and it displays a picture fairly well. Uh, there were two functions on it. There was the white on black uh, background, which I've got it on now, but also the black on white background, which was sort of typically used. Uh, you would have to sort of typically use that for Windows. And uh, at the moment, the machine's just booting into DOS. Boots fairly fast. Um, and for some reason I was trying to get it to work on the external monitor, I'm not sure why, as I couldn't get it to work in the end, but as you can see the, um, the unit itself is uh, it's in pretty good shape, it is actually working. Hard drive is a little bit vocal, but you know, it's not the end of the world. Really not sure why I tried to get that working on there, I need to have a word with myself about that. So what we uh, do now is we uh, do the standard procedure to get into Windows if you don't have it in your auto exit bat file. Oh yeah, that was something else that happened at this particular point. For some reason, I was not accepting any keyboard inputs. So there is a little reset button on the machine, which I've just pressed next to the uh, the various LEDs on the top of the unit. 
and all that does is literally just reset the machine which you would obviously expect it to do does its standard RAM checks at this point which you can skip if uh, you need to something else I found quite interesting was I haven't actually powered this machine on for a year and the last time I powered it on I hadn't powered it on for several years and uh, the um, the lithium battery which maintains the uh, the CMOS RAM had actually completely drained out so I had to take the machine apart then to get all of the details off the hard drive so sectors, cylinders etc. This time when I turned it on it had retained all of those settings so you know another bit of uh, sort of over engineering there and sort of a proof that uh, certainly even machines that were sort of I suppose potentially sort of at the cheaper end of the market still use pretty high quality components and you can sort of really tell when you actually strip the machine down everything is of a very nice quality I mean it is it is a very good machine in my humble opinion it is a very good machine indeed and you know even today although as you can see here the screen isn't perfect you can you know you can still use it you could probably sort of do some basic word processing on the particular unit itself in fact if you look at the keyboard uh, it's got those sort of classic stickers on it which uh, with the little dots on on the shift alt and control buttons typically you would find these stickers on a machine that had the word perfect word processing software installed do you remember that word perfect certainly took me back when I first used it although at the time when I first got it word perfect was still something that was fairly uh, fairly sort of current and something that was certainly used so I can't really remember what I was trying to do there. So I powered the machine off and just turned it on again. So we're coming in again and we're going through the standard to the posting procedure. And really this was just um, an opportunity to test the machine once I'd um, put the hard drive back into the unit coming into DOS again WIN obviously for Windows and in we go now this is where you have to switch the switch so it now goes to instead of being white on black it would now be black on white within DOS <clears throat> interestingly because I was looking at the screen um, from an angle if I'm looking at it from an angle which I was the image is actually absolutely perfect but obviously straight on as the camera is showing it didn't actually come out that wonderfully to be honest so coming into Windows it's uh, it is loading into Windows as you can see and it's um, it's a little slow to come into Windows, but I'd be perfectly honest with you, it is no different to other 386SXs that I'd, uh, I've had in the past with Windows installed. The interesting thing about the SX processor is it was a full 32-bit CPU, but it interfaced with a 16-bit motherboard, so 16-bit data bus. So obviously you've got a full 32-bit core, but you are interfacing through 16-bit data bus. So you are effectively halving uh, the speed in some respects. After this video had actually been taken, I did actually notice this machine has Doom 2 installed. So for a bit of a laugh, I tried to run up Doom 2. It does work, but you have to... <laughs> you have to run uh, Doom 2 in minimal settings and there we go so that was just really a brief expose of the Amstrad ALT386 I'd like to thank you all very much for watching if you have enjoyed this video don't forget to hit that like button and also consider subscribing for more upcoming fascinating hobbies